Well, it's a privilege to be back with you all again. And uh, this is back home. And uh, I think it was 26 or maybe, Linda's saying 28. I can't be that old. 94, that wasn't 28 years ago. That was only 26 years ago, wasn't it? Anyway, how many years ago, it's been a lot of years uh, that uh, we've been members of the Elm Grove Baptist Church. Uh, we were sent out by this church. I was ordained and commissioned by this church. And uh, it's always a joy to come back. And so uh, I probably don't have my mic on. Do I not have my mic on, gentlemen? It's on? Okay. I'm kind of a loud mouth anyway. Uh, I, I feel like I'm preaching on Super Bowl Sunday because something else is going on and everybody really just wants to get to the score and forget about <laughs> and forget about what I might be saying up here. But uh, so that being the case, I thought I would bring a, a message tonight that is certainly a message all about missions, but it's also kind of a novelty message. Uh, you, those of you that know me know that I like illustrations. And so I'm going to bring a, a kind of a different novelty type message tonight. And we're going to start in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to do a bit of an illustration tonight. And what I'm going to use for an illustration is this little pistol right here. Okay. Now don't worry. I'm not going to shoot it. I'm not going to shoot it at anybody. I did this illustration in front of our Spanish church down in Wichita. And they said, why don't you shoot it? And I said, guys, don't you understand? This is a 50 caliber pistol. It'll blow a hole the size of your thumb in the roof. And they said, we're Mexicans. We know how to fix roofs. <laughs> that's, that's a true story. <laughs> but but I, I am going to use this as a little bit of an illustration of missions. And you say, what does that have to do with missions? Just hold on to your hats. We're going to get there. Uh, what I want you to realize, this is a pistol that starts with P. All right. So if you're taking notes on this message, everything that starts with a P is a point in this message. And you'll hear me kind of emphasizing the P's because those are the primary points of the message tonight. So everything that starts with a P is kind of important. And the first thing we're going to start with in Romans chapter 10 starts with a P and it is the most important thing that I will share with you tonight. And that's the plan of salvation. Amen. Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse nine says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, that's the most important thing that I can share with you. And by the way, that's the most important thing that we can take and share with anybody in this world. Because every single person born in this world needs to be saved. Just a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago in Kenya, I had a pastor asking me for glasses for his daughter. And I found him some glasses for her and then I said, she wasn't there. So I said, is your daughter saved? And he said, my daughter was born a Christian. And I said, ooh, I got a problem. First of all, I'm not sure your daughter's saved. Second of all, I'm not sure you're saved either. Because nobody's born a Christian. You have to be saved. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to be saved today. It's as simple as that. Hell is an awful place and Jesus Christ has given you a free ticket to get out of there. Won't you accept that today? That's the first P, the plan of salvation. Right there from Romans chapter 10. But back up a little ways in Romans chapter 10, there's some things that most people miss when they're reading through this chapter. And that starts up in verse 2, and I'll call this P the problem of the world. The problem of the world. Look at verse 2. It says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. 
Now listen to this. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I love that it says being ignorant of God's righteousness. You know what? The condition of the world today, there's plenty of people in this world that have never heard the gospel. I could go on and on about the people that have never heard the name of Jesus, on and on about the people that have never read the Bible or even seen one. But 10 times more than that is the number of people who know about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus. They've seen the Bible. They may even have one. They believe in somebody called Jesus, but they believe that they're going to get right with Jesus by their good works. That is the vast majority of lost people in the world today. They come to us in our clinics and they come in and say, oh, I know all about Jesus. And, and I say, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Well, I'm trying to. I'm working to get there. That's the problem that this world has and it's rampant everywhere. Okay. And it says being ignorant of God's righteousness you know, if you had even a little speck of a clue how righteous God our Father is, you'd realize in a heartbeat that you can't ever satisfy a righteous God by any works that you can do. But the people of the world are ignorant of God's righteousness. And they're going about by the works of the law, by good works, by good things. They're trying to get saved and they're not submitting themselves to the righteousness of God by being saved through Jesus Christ. And that's the problem that we have in the world. So what is missions but addressing that problem that we have? So that's the plan and the problem. The next thing is the process of sending preachers to the problem. Look at verse, verse 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not heard, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? For it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How shall they preach except they be sent? There has to be a process of sending preachers to the problem. And so we're going to illustrate that process with a pistol. And we're going to consider that process like a shot out of a gun, directed like a target straight at the problem, which is the people of the world not trusting Jesus as their Savior. So we're going to take a shot at that problem. And that shot, we're going to start out with the shot itself. That shot is a picture of God because it has three parts. You see, we serve a God that's triune, a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit, and the shot is a picture of the parts of God. And the first part I want you to think about is the powder or the propellant. And the powder or the propellant is a picture of the power of God the Father. It's the powder, that little charge of powder that gives the power to the pistol and lets it address the problem. So the powder is the power of God. Now powder is powerful stuff. I remember one time years and years ago, I had a pastor friend of mine hand me a big bag of trash that he found in his garage. He knew I was going out to the burn pile to burn some trash. And he said, would you take this out and burn it for me? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I took it out with me and I put it in the fire with all the rest of the trash and lit it. And then I crawled back up into my truck to sweep out the back of the truck. And all of a sudden I couldn't see anything but fire everywhere and a terrible roar. And I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And I, luckily I was in the truck. I'd have been fried if I'd have been outside. And uh, so I, longest time I didn't know what happened. And about two months later, that pastor came to me and he said, you know, it's the funniest thing. So I can't find my powder horn. I said, I know where it went. <laughs> There's, there's power in that powder. And what a perfect picture of the power of God. Because that's the power that makes everything work. So the second part of that three-part shot that I want to mention is the priming charge. 
Now the priming charge is powder too, but it's a different type of powder. In fact, have you ever heard it? Have you ever heard someone say that the God, the father and God, the Holy spirit are the same in substance, but different in form. Well, that's exactly the way it is between the powder in the powder charge and the powder in the priming charge, because they're both powder and they're both made of the same chemicals, but they're different in their form and in their properties. And that priming charge is the smallest part of the thing, but it's what starts it all. You see, the priming charge is that little flash of fire that's the call of God in someone's life that takes them away from the ordinary and puts them into the will of God. It's that fire that comes on their life and won't let them do anything but serve God as he's called them to do. You remember the story of Samson, how he took firebrands and tied them between the tails of those little foxes and lit them on fire. And the little foxes spread the fire everywhere. Why? Because they didn't have any choice. They had to either spread it or burn right up. And that's what the call of God does to someone. It gets on your life and you've got to go out and you've got to do what God's called you to do. That's the fire that comes with the primer. And in a pistol, that fire is what starts everything out. And it only takes a spark to start that fire. You might remember old camp days. We used to sing a song. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. That's the priming charge. And then the final thing is the projectile, the bullet, if you want to call it that. But the projectile is a perfect picture of the living word of God, which is Jesus Christ. You see, the projectile is the thing that goes out and addresses the problem. The projectile is the end goal of missions. The projectile is what actually gets the work done. And that's the living word of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what changes things. That's what hits the target and solves the problem. And so in every shot, we have a picture of God the Father in the powder and God the Holy Spirit in the priming charge and Jesus Christ in the projectile. So where is the missionary in all this? The missionary, we'll call him the person. The missionary is represented by this right here. You know what that's called? That's called the patch. And we'll say that represents the person of the missionary. And you know what that patch is? It's just an old rag of common cloth. It's nothing special. It has no power. It has no value. It's only function in the world is to wrap around that projectile and slide down the barrel of that gun until it makes contact with the power of the powder. And then when the shot goes off, guess what happens to that projectile? It feels the power. It's the power that pushes the projectile. But it's the patch that connects them together. It's the patch that engages the rifling and makes the shot go where it's supposed to go. But you know what? After that shot is fired, what happens to the patch? It goes on a ways with the projectile and then it just falls away. It's done. It's accomplished what it was supposed to do, but the projectile keeps going until it hits the target and does the work. You know what? That's a perfect picture of the person in missions. Oh, listen, if you go out after a shot is fired and you pick up this patch off the ground, you know what you'll find? You'll find that it's all burnt in the middle, sometimes burnt clear through. You'll find that the edges are frayed and torn and tattered. It's not good for anything else anymore. It's burned up and burned out and used up and it's good for nothing, but it's done its job. And that's the person of missions. A missionary should be involved in working themselves out of a job. John the Baptist said of Jesus Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that's the story of missions. So that's what's in the shot. Let's talk about the pistol itself. You see, the pistol is a picture of the church. Because it's the pistol that sends the person with the projectile under the power of the powder and the primer to address the problem. That's the purpose of the local church in missions. 
And so the pistol is a picture of the church. And the, the pistol is a process that has three primary parts. I want to talk about those three parts. And the first part I'll call production, that's the lock. You know what a lock is on a pistol? That's this thing right here. That's what starts the spark that starts the priming charge that puts the whole thing in motion. And I call that production, why? Because it's the lock that gets the whole process going. You see, missionaries play out after a while and there's gotta be new ones to go on the field. When I go around groups of missionaries, you know what I find? A lot of times I'm the youngest guy in the room and I'm old. There aren't young people coming out to replace the missionaries. We have a dying missions force in this world and nobody's out to replace them. You know why? Because the church is not involved in production. The church needs to be about the process of producing new missionaries, even choice men. If you look in your Bible in Acts chapter 13, you'll see that God, by the Holy Spirit, called a bunch of men together and he says, separate me for the work of God, the men that I choose. And guess who he chose? He chose the pastor and his right-hand man, his assistant pastor. And he said, send out your two best men to the mission field. And you know what those guys did? They sent them. And guess what? A few years later, the church was doing great and the missionaries had started new churches all across the known world because they simply gave God what he asked for. The process of producing new missionaries. That's the purpose of the lock. And you know, the lock is an amazing piece of equipment. This is a flint lock pistol. And the flint lock is unbelievable because everything has to be right for it to work. It has to have the right kind of rock in there. It has to have the right kind of steel in the frizzen. Everything has to be lined up at the right angle and it has to hit just right in order to make that spark that sends things out. And if it doesn't make the spark, nothing happens. The church needs to have a program for producing missionaries, that's production. And that happens at church camp. It happens in missions conferences. It happens when missionaries come in. It happens when people just listen to the word of God. It happens when preachers preach about missions, but it has to happen. Because if it doesn't happen, the missionary force that's out there now is gonna die out and there won't be anyone to replace them. And you know, this lock has an important feature too. It has what's called a half cock. You see, when you wanna fire it, you gotta pull it all the way back like that and then it makes the spark. I won't set my coat on fire. But if it's only halfway back, it won't spark yet, it's just getting ready. And you know what, there's a lot of people that are interested in going in missions, but they're not quite ready yet. You ever heard the, the saying, somebody went off half cocked? I, I think there's a lot of people in, uh, forgive me for saying, there's a lot of people in the mission field that went off half cocked. And sometimes the process of production needs to be about holding people back until they're ready to go. But when they're ready to go, they gotta be sent. That's the lock. And that's the first part, that's production. Let's talk about the second part. The second part I'm gonna talk about is the stock. Now that's the biggest part of the pistol. That's the thing that you see the most. I kinda think it's the prettiest part. The stock represents provision. You see, part of the process of sending preachers into the world is providing for them. And the church does very well in the area of provision. The stock provision is what keeps the whole thing together. It keeps it on target, it keeps it going. It's the most visible part. But listen carefully, without the other parts, it's nothing but a club to knock someone over the head with. It doesn't have any purpose without everything else. So that's the stock. Now let's talk about the barrel. And I'm gonna say that the barrel represents prayer. You see, the purpose of the barrel is to pair up the power of the powder with the patch and the projectile. And it's prayer that keeps your missionaries going. 
It's prayer that keeps the direction of their aim straight. It's prayer that helps them withstand the force of the powder when they're pushing the projectile out. It's prayer that supports missionaries all along. And that's the barrel. And listen, without the barrel, it won't work. So simply stated, the church needs to support missions lock, stock, and barrel. Amen. If you've never heard that statement before, the church has to be a part of production. It has to be a part of provision. And it has to be a part of prayer. And that's how church supports missions. Well, I said that was the primary parts. There's a few more parts. That's a ramrod. The ramrod represents the process of preparation. You see that shot isn't any good till it all gets put together. Something has to put the powder and the patch and the projectile into the barrel of prayer in order for it to function. And that's the ramrod. And sometimes the church needs to be the ramrod. Sometimes, listen, missionaries come in, it ought to be all about the primer and the powder and the projectile until everything is put together for that person to go and address the problem. So that's the ramrod. Now there's another piece. This piece is called the pin. It's also called the key and that's appropriate because it's a key piece of the pistol, but it's called the pin. And you know what the pin represents? The pin represents the pastor. Because the pin is what holds this whole thing together. It just slides right into that little keyhole and keeps the prayer and the provision and the production all together. And it keeps the thing from busting out the ramrod when it fires. So the pastor is an important part of missions. And a church that doesn't have a pastor behind missions isn't going to send out very many projectiles so the pin holds it all together. So that's how the pistol fits into the plan of missions. There is one more part that I need to mention. Over here on the sides, holding the lock to the stock, there's a couple of screws. And those screws are the plan or the program. You know, you've probably heard it said, people don't plan to fail, they just fail to plan. And a church will not have a good mission program if they don't plan on it. You need to have a plan to keep production and provision together. Missions conferences are part of the plan. Missions Sundays are part of a plan. I like that mission thing that was up there somewhere. It's not up there anymore. But everything that has to do with providing for missionaries through the church is part of the plan. And that's what holds it all together. So you have to have a plan to keep production together with the provision. Now, anybody think I'm about out of peas yet? I'm about out of breath, but there's some peas still left. Anybody out there know what this is? That's a pouch, but it's not really, it's a possible's bag. They call it that because there's everything in there that you could possibly need. That's a possible's bag. But you know that possible's bag, to me, that is a picture of potential of the people of the church. You see, in this possible's bag is all kinds of things that are used for different purposes. And out there in the church, there's all kinds of people, and every single one has potential. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me, I don't know what I would do on a mission trip. I'm not medical. I'm not this. I'm not that. We've had some unbelievable people on, on mission trips with us. We had a mechanic go with us. Never had a problem with our equipment before. Three pieces of equipment broke down. He fixed them all. <laughs> had an occupational therapist go on a mission trip with us one time. I never wanted an occupational therapist for anything on a mission trip before. I had seven people in about the first day that needed an occupational therapist. Why? Because God pairs what we have with what we need. And if God asks you to do something, there's a reason. 
Every single person has potential to do something powerful and important in the process of putting the projectile into the problem. And that's what this little bag of possibilities reminds me of. There's possibilities in this church. And by the way, now it's time for a commercial. We're going to Honduras first week of June. We have a very, very small team and we could use some more people. This is the last day to sign up. So if you want to go to Honduras and see a ton of people get saved, talk to me. All right, commercial's over. Here's a part I really like. Here's another P. This is a pick. All right. And I call this pick persuasion to persist. Now listen to me very carefully. I've heard a lot of people's testimonies over the years. And you know what I hear people tell me all the time? They tell me all the time, you know what? When I was a small child, I went to camp and I answered God's call to the mission field, but it never happened. Well, when I was a young adult, I told God that I'd be a missionary, but I never did. I've always wanted to be a missionary and I believe God would like me to do that, but I've never done it. I've had old people, old people fixing to die in the nursing home tell me my biggest regret in life is that God called me to the mission field and I didn't go. I have had over the course of my 27 or so years, my wife says 28, 28 or so years of doing this, I have had five young men walk up to me and say, I am going to medical school so I can be a doctor on a mission field like you are, and I haven't seen a one of them on the mission field yet. What happens? Well, you know, sometimes when you fire this gun, the spark comes down and the priming charge goes off and nothing else happens. You know what they call that? They call that a flash in the pan. And listen, a flash in the pan happens with an awful lot of people who are called to missions. Probably 90% of the people who had professed that they're called are a flash in the pan. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'd be willing to bet in a group this size, there's at least a half a dozen people, maybe a dozen, that would say at some point in my life I was called to missions and I haven't gone. Let me tell you two things. First of all, it's not too late for you. Second of all, don't let that happen to somebody else. You see, the purpose of the pick is to just open everything up so that that fire goes exactly where it's supposed to go and it's not a flash in the pan. And sometimes when someone gets called to missions, when someone gets called to preach, when someone gets called to full-time service, they need someone to just pick them a little bit, to just keep poking them, to just keep reminding them, to just keep after them until they do what God's called them to do. If you're here and you've been called and you didn't go, don't be a flash in the pan, do something about it. If you say, well, it's too late for me to go, maybe it's not, talk to God about that. But if you're sure it's too late, Think about being the pick that picks someone else into going. Think about sharing your testimony with someone. Think about telling someone, man, I wish I had gone. Well, that's the pick. That uh, persuasion to persist. Well, I'm about done. I don't know if they're done counting the ballots yet or not. I told them if they was too slow counting them to wave a flag at me and I'd just keep on preaching all night long. <laughs> they told me that wasn't going to be a problem, so we'll see. That was a white flag of surrender. Yeah, white flag of surrender. Okay, last, <laughs> last P's. I, I am about out of P's. My last two P's are protection and preservation. You see, what I got here is just a little rag with some oil on it. And you know what? These parts on this pistol, they rust easy, especially after you fire some powder through them. And when they get rusty, they stop working. You got to protect them and you got to preserve them with a little oil. You know what? Missions gets rusty if we don't take care of it. 
If we stop hearing about missions, if we stop hearing about all those people that are dying and going to hell without Jesus, all of a sudden it just rusts up and nobody cares anymore. I had a preacher friend of mine show me a pistol. He says, somebody gave me this black powder pistol so many years ago and I've had it down in the basement and he pulled it out and it was just red with rust. And the cylinder wouldn't even turn because he hadn't put any oil on it. And it didn't even function. And he said, boy, I'm going to have to take this apart and clean it up. Probably take him hours to get that thing back where it's supposed to be. But wouldn't it have been better if he'd have just kept a little bit of prevention and a little bit of protection on that pistol? You know what? The church has to have a little oil, a little protection, and a little prevention so it can keep on sending out the projectile to the world. Well... Let me just say one more thing. The lock, the process of production, of all the things I've told you about, that may be the most expensive. Provision may cost you a little money. Prayer may cost you a little time. But production may cost you your kids or your grandkids or your preachers or your deacons or your friend or someone that sat next to you or maybe your town doctor. I remember I had a lady, when I went into mission field, someone came up to her and said, oh, isn't it wonderful? Dr. Waller's going to the mission field. And the other lady said, well, I'd think it was wonderful if your doctor was going. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what? Production costs. It costs something to keep people in the mission field. Well, the question is simple. Are you behind missions, lock, stock, and barrel? Let's have head bowed and eyes closed for just a minute. A few simple questions, and I'll leave you alone. And the first question is, are you sitting here called to go to missions? Maybe when you were a child, maybe when you were a young adult, I don't know when, maybe just last week, maybe just tonight. Are you called into missions and you haven't done it yet? And you know what God wants you to do? Listen, my wife resisted God's call. And that's a hard thing to do, she'll tell you. You can ask her for her testimony. But I wonder if there's anyone here that would say, you know what? God's called me to do something in missions that I haven't done yet. Nobody's looking around. You'd raise a hand and say, God's called me to do something and I haven't done it. Is there anyone like that? God's called me to do something. Amen. God's called me to do something. I see a couple of hands. Anyone else? God's called me to do something and I haven't done it yet. Listen, don't leave tonight without doing it. Maybe there's someone here that would say, you know what? Maybe I'm a little part of the problem. Maybe I'm still trying to earn my way into heaven by good works. And I haven't really understood fully the righteousness of God. And I need to get right with God and I need to be saved tonight. I need to be sure that I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I need to be sure. Is there anyone like that tonight? You'd raise a hand and say, you know what? I've been trying to work my way into heaven. I know Jesus. I love Jesus, but I'm still trying to work my way there. Anyone like that tonight? Amen. Anyone else? I'm still trying to work my way. We're going to have an invitation in a minute. I'd ask you to stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to pray. We're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe you're here. You say, I need to do more for missions than I've been doing. Maybe you're here. You'd say, I need to go to the mission field. God called me and I haven't done it. Maybe you're here and you need to be saved. Whatever your need is, as we have the invitation time, you come. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We thank you for this illustration. May it touch our hearts. May it go deep into our lives. Lord, may you lead us in the paths that you'd have us to go. Lord, I just pray if there's one here that's not 100% sure they're saved, don't let them leave tonight without trusting Jesus. Don't let them leave tonight until they're over trusting their works and they understand the righteousness of God. 
Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to be a part of the solution to the problem of the world. Bless now in the invitation time, bless the vote. And Lord, just let your spirit be here in all that is done. In Jesus' name, amen.